Today we're starting a series called Interpreting Mushkin, where we're going to be walking through different interpretations of the phenomenal character Mushkin in Dostoevsky's works, The Idiot, from the lesser known interpretations to his more well known interpretations. In this video, we're going to be talking about two main interpretations, which I categorize into the same category, which is Mushkin as an Antichrist or Mushkin as suffering from hubris. Now, before we talk into those two different um, interpretations directly, I want to talk about the context for a bit because understanding the context of a book of the writer is a very important stage in understanding more about how we're meant to approach a certain character or a certain element of the book. And this main comparison in the contextual sense is between the early drafts of Mushkin and the later drafts and letters of Mushkin. So in the early drafts of Mushkin, we get Mushkin being presented as a hypocritical, proud and vengeful being, which is a very different presentation from the later Mushkin or the later drafts where Dostoevsky is talking about writing a positively good human being in the likes of Don Quixote or Jean Valjean from Victor Hugo's novel. So there definitely is that discussion or that room for discussion when you're thinking about, well, how much did that early draft of Mushkin reach its second later drafts of Mushkin, even if Dostoevsky intended to change the approach, perhaps some of the elements from the first draft remains and then leads to these interpretations of Mushkin as Antichrist or as someone suffering from hubris. Now, with the context in mind, let's start thinking about first Janet Tucker's interpretation of Mushkin as suffering from hubris. The term hubris arises from the Greek word for pride. To conceptualize all the Greek heroes when they completed their tasks, all then tried to become God, and as a result, in the process of becoming God, were stricken down by their gods, and as a result, their fatal flaw was called hubris. So in the same way, there's this connotation to hubris of an attempt to become God. And in Janet Tucker's interpretation, she argues that, well, Mushkin is himself trying to become God in his attempt to control people. Even though his intentions are fundamentally good, his attempt to try to control the lives and destinies of those around him is a very strong indication that perhaps he is viewing himself as superior to others and is trying to dictate how other people are meant to live their lives. For example, in the situation of Nastasia and Rogozhin in particular, he is trying to dictate their fate in, in the direction of goodness. And that is a very interesting point of view, because if this was to be the case, perhaps the idea is, it's not only the case that, well, all right, it's, it just matters. The only thing which matters is that your, your intentions are good. But it also likewise matters that you are trying to let people have their own free will. Yes, you could say God has a bird eye view to say, well, okay, these people or this set of events is the best possible world. However, for us as humans, even if we have the right intentions, even if we are trying to live out a Christian love, we cannot try to just play God and say, well, okay, you have to do that. You have to do that. You have to follow what I think is the best future for you. And in some sense, it's a very tempting thing to try to do, especially in the situation of parenting, right? You, you see someone growing up or in mentorship, right? I, I see someone growing up, I'm trying to mentor them. And it's very tempting for me to say, well, okay, I know what's best for you. I'm going to try to make you do certain things which will be best for who you are. And it might be the case that I'm right, that these certain things are the best for who this person is. But it's not right for me to then say, well, okay, you have to follow what I'm saying and you have to do X, Y, and Z because that's just a form of hubris. That's a form of pride for me trying to dictate into your life what I want your life to be like instead of letting you make the decision, even if that decision is going to let, lead you down a poor path. And that I think is a more pure form of love, which we'll talk about later, but that's a more pure form of Christian existence, which is to say, well, I love you, but I'll let you make your mistakes. I'll let you suffer. I'll let you struggle. But then that is a recognition, a, a respect for the free will and the love that God has given you. And as a result, in some sense, in Mushkin's attempt to try to control the lives of those around him, he is suffering from that hubris instead of trying to fully just let people be and recognize that, yes, people might be fallen, people might not be living the life that is best for them, but I need to respect them and love them in spite of that. So that's an interesting perspective to read Mushkin. Another element of that is Amber Dyer's presentation of Mushkin as Antichrist. Now that might surprise you because of course, Dostoevsky views Christ as a positively good being, the, the archetype per se of that positively good being par excellence. But on the other hand, you have Mushkin, which is in some sense, a positively good human being who's meant to be following the Christ. But at the same time, Amber Dyer says he is actually the Antichrist. So why might Amber Dyer argue for that? Well, the big reason for that is because I think what 
Mushkin is presenting, at least Jadaya is saying that, well, Mushkin is presenting a deviation of the Christian love. Although he's presenting elements of it, he's not presenting the full picture. And it's precisely that deviation of the Christian message which then separates um, Mushkin from the Christ-like figure that he's meant to be. Now, why does that slight deviation make a big difference? Think about the devil, for example. The devil doesn't try to tempt you by saying, well, I am the enemy, I'm the devil, come, follow me, be a satanic worshipper. Of course, some people do follow that route. But most of the situation, or most of the time, the devil is saying, well, look, I'm your friend. I know things better than you. I am kind of like God. You have the picture of Satan in the garden with Eve, right? Saying, well, you might not surely die if you ate that apple. You might not truly die in the sense that you think you will die. So in that sense, well, all right, he is saying a certain element of the situation. But he's only giving a certain picture of the way the world works. He's giving a certain picture of, of Christ, but not the full picture. And in the same way, and this is Dyer's argument, that Mushkin, by acting out of pity and compassion, instead of actually loving people, he then becomes antichrist for not fulfilling the whole truth of the Christian love, which is a pure love for someone for who they are and not out of pity or compassion. And and you might say, well, does Mushkin love out of pity and compassion? The answer is yes. For example, he describes his love for Nastasia as he's loving her out of pity. He's loving her out of pity, not necessarily because he loves her as herself. Of course, he does have some sense of love towards her, but that love is a form of pity. And he pities her. And why is pity so dangerous, you may ask? Well, because pity is fundamentally a form tying to hubris of saying, well, I pity you because you're beneath me. I don't pity Elon Musk because Elon Musk is richer than me. I don't pity him at all. But I might feel pity towards a beggar in the street because, well, they're homeless. I have a roof over my head. I pity them. Now, is that necessarily a bad emotion? Well, no, I think it calls, it calls attention to people in need. But nevertheless, if you're going to then love them because of the pity, instead of loving them for who they are, you create an interesting dynamic where you're loving them and you're looking down on them and you're loving them because of this relationship. You're loving that relationship and not the person themselves. True Christian love says, I love Elon Musk and I love the beggar alike because of who they are, intrinsically of who they are. Not because one person's richer than me, not because one's lower than me, not because one person might have more money, whatever those circumstances might be, which may lead to this type of relationship. I love them because of who they are, not because of the circumstances they're in. It's non-circumstantial. It's deontological, perhaps, in its, in its truest sense. It's categorical, because you love them for who they are and not because of any circumstances around them. But Mushkin doesn't necessarily embody that true, pure Christian love, but rather loves Nastasia out of pity. And in that sense, you could say, well, perhaps Mushkin is right, Dyer is right in her interpretation of Mushkin as that antichrist because he is not truly loving in the correct way. Now, compassion. What's wrong about compassion? Well, compassion itself isn't wrong, but I think the way in which Dyer presents it is, is very interesting. She says, well, all right. What the type of compassion we're talking about is not the Christian compassion, but it's a form of secular compassion in, in the sense that instead of saying, I forgive you of your sins and I still love you in spite of your sins, Mushkin is following the Rousseauian, the Enlightenment route by saying, well, actually, I will deny the existence of sin at all. I will ignore the existence of sin and just love you regardless of whatever is going on. I don't care about that and I, I'll just love you anyways. And that is where the problem arises. C the Christian message stems from two clear facts. The kingdom of heaven's at hand, and that means you are a sinner. And number two, that God recognizes and loves you and died for your sins. There is a recognition of sin at the core of the Christian message. Christian comparison says, I know you have sin. I'm a sinful person, but I love you and I recognize your sin. I forgive your sin. Sin exists. But in, Rousseau, in Rousseau's view, and perhaps in Mushkin's view, and you see that in his treatment of Marie, perhaps that's the best example of this situation. He seems to deny the existence of sin in, in, in the sense of he's saying, well, actually, hold up a second. I don't really accept that your sin exists. I'll ignore it. I'll love you and I wouldn't care about that sin. And sometimes that has a very horrible terror, turn because the character, Marie, she might want that forgiveness of sin because humans recognize our sin in the sense of crime and punishment. We recognize our sins and we know we deserve punishment for it. And we want to seek a forgiveness, a recognition of that sin, an overcoming of it. Not just to say that sin doesn't exist. If I killed someone, right, if, if Rogozhin killed someone, he doesn't want someone to say to him, well, say, all right, your sin doesn't exist. Killing people isn't bad. That's not what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, well, actually, no, yes, your sin exists. Yes, you've fallen. Yes, you're a bad human being. Yes, you deserve hell, but I forgive you nonetheless. That is Christian love. 
by saying in a Rousseauian sense, while saying, well, humans are all good, sin is only a, a byproduct of the bad nature they're in. Everywhere man is born free, sinless, but everywhere he's in chains, he's fallen into sin because of his social environments. Well, then you're denying sin, and that's not helpful for other people. And as a result, Mary dies, Marie dies in a very horrible, suffering situation because her sin is never truly forgiven, it's purely ignored. And in that sense, you say, well, perhaps it's right, Mushkin is the Antichrist in some sense because he doesn't fully embody the Christian love. So that's our analysis of Mushkin's interpretation as the Antichrist or hubris. Let me know your thoughts about this interpretation below or your thoughts about Mushkin in general. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking more about different interpretations of Mushkin, so I can't wait to share it with you. Before I end off this video, a huge thank you goes to all the Patreons who support our channel. It means so much to me to be able to continuously make these videos, continuously improve these videos, and provide free and accessible videos to the world. It means the world to me, so thank you so much to all the Patreons who support this channel. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification to stay tuned to more videos on Mushkin, Dostoevsky, philosophy and more. Stay safe, my friends. See you soon. Thank you for watching. God bless and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.